Um, I have three things I want to do this morning. I have 90 minutes. I do want to leave some time for questions. And uh, so here are my three things I want to do. First, I'm going to go through about 32 pictures very quickly just to give you context of, of what we do uh, at our farm. Secondly, I want to um, uh, run down some of um, the assumptions, paradigms, buzzwords that were used yesterday by the National Industrial Farmers Union. <laughs> Um, and and uh, uh, kind of dissect a little bit of that for us. Uh, I just can't help it. And then uh, the third thing I'm going to do is conclude with what I call my 10 benchmarks of truth. As I've thought and thought about what could I add to the to the discussion here as we look at the future of UK farming. Um, I think that all of our futures are going to actually be wrapped up in in truth um, this side or the other side of eternity it doesn't really but but eventually truth will win out and um, and what are those those benchmarks of truth because um, if I'm gonna bet, uh, bet on a horse I want to bet on the truth horse so quickly a context it's always uh, the temptation uh, at a place like this to assume that the other person is successful or can do things because um, because they have this incredibly unfair uh, environment where you know uh, it, 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 it snows only at night the leaves fall into neat little piles you know Camelot um, <laughs> Uh, all, of the, all of the people in our community want to spend more for food. Um, you know, you have a spouse that loves crazy ideas. I mean, they're, you know, always all sorts of things. And so um, it's important to remember that every single one of us has uh, assets and liabilities in our context. Uh, some of us have mechanical ability. Some of us have communication ability. Some of us have organizational ability. Some of us are great starters. Some of us are great finishers. Um, uh, you know, some of us are on hilly land where we can do, you know, gravity-fed water systems like we do on our place. Uh, some of us are on flat land where we can pump water long distances cheaply. Uh, you know, the, the, the point is that every place has its asset and its liability. So... Um, just, just you know, let me let me run through the story here very quickly, and uh, bring you up to our context, and then we'll we'll embark on some of these other things. So yes, we are polyphased farm. We're not just one faced. We're many faced. Uh, healing the land one bite at a time is our uh, moniker, and uh, we do that in order to make sure that our customers understand that that they are uh, directly. And, uh, and viscerally participating in the land, in the landscape their children will inherit one bite at a time. It does indeed add up that way. We are in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, the breadbasket of the uh, Confederacy during the War of Northern Aggression. And um, <laughs> we are certified bioterrorists. Um, <laughs> You know, our, our uh, conventional Orthodox neighbors, uh, uh, you know, I, I say I, I trust them with my grandchildren, I trust them with my bank account, I just don't trust them with the land or my food. Um, and, and because we're on completely different uh, uh, wavelengths, way, completely different paradigms. Um, just a couple of things that we do here. Uh, when we do, uh, we, we, you know, I'll just I'll just throw some shots here. Uh, we do when we feed hay in the winter time. We um, cover the animals with a awning. Notice there's no sides on the barn. Those cows are dropping 50 pounds of material out their back end every day. It's uh, gushy, and um, it's. If it gets dry, it vaporizes. We all know what that smells like. If it gets wet, it leaches into the groundwater. And so what we do is, um, is, is put them under a, an awning so we can feed hay. These boxes are on pulleys. There's pulleys here so we can raise and lower these feed boxes. Um, as I go through this, I'm not gonna belabor the point, but just appreciate that all of these models um, impact design, infrastructure design. And a lot of what we do is, uh, is how do we create infrastructure 
to capitalize on these uh, principles of nature. So one of the things we need to be able to do is have a design that accommodates deep bedding buildup. Nature sanitizes two ways. One, with rest and sunshine. That's the pasture rotational grazing system. The other is with vibrant decomposition. That's the compost system of hygiene. And so what we're doing here is putting the cows, is, is letting this bedding build up. The cows, of course, they trop out the uh, oxygen. So this bedding pack just builds up behind uh, underneath the cows, you know, up to way over a meter deep. I mean, you know, they start rubbing their backs on the top of the uh, barn rafters before long. And, um, and it's all anaerobic. We add corn to it as we build it. The corn then ferments in this bedding pack. When the cows come back out to grazing, we turn in the piggerators. Uh, the pigs then go through this. They're seeking the fermented grain and they convert it from anaerobic fermentation to aerobic compost. The animals are doing the work, not machinery. Um, so on, on our farm, what we're trying to do is utilize the animals to fill their unique role as an, as an honor, as a respect. Uh, for example, here to the pigness of the pig. Pigs are not just bacon and pork chops. They then, by, by doing all this work for us, uh, they become co-laborers and partners in this grand land healing ministry. And this changes the whole emotional, spiritual, relational, as well as economic and physical uh, relationship we have with them. This way, instead of putting our money into big compost turners and machines and petroleum, we're simply uh, buying uh, machines, if you will, the pigs, buying machines for $100 and selling them for $1,000. That's the way I like depreciation on machines. <laughs> And, and you know, and you don't have to change your oil, they don't need spare parts, they don't need minimum wage, you don't need to pay workman's compensation for them, you know, and, 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 and they love to do this. This is not something they don't love to do. And it fully honors and respects the pig. Then they go out into pig pastures and we move them every five to 12 days through these pig pastures using the animals as a, as a landscape um, um, management uh, accessory, okay, to create these beautiful silvo pastures um, under, the, under the woods, widely spaced trees. Um, just as an as a interesting little side note, I can't help but mention it, that the, um, the, the pre-European American landscape, the forestal economy all ran on small, small diameter stuff. Because when you're before saws, what do you do with a big tree? <laughs> you leave it, okay? And um, uh, I mean, there are stories. There are stories of indigenous, you know, Native American villages spending a week, um, you know, running a smoldering fire around a big oak to try to, you know, bring it down. And so, for centuries, the early American uh, forestal economy was based on using little saplings, little stuff, diseased crookeds and little stuff that, that could be gathered and, and uh, bent and that sort of thing and leave the big ones. And so there was a, 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 genetic, um, uh, a, a genetic movement toward you know, cathedral type trees, large, uh, big trees. When the Europeans came with steel and saws, it's a lot more efficient to uh, saw a big tree than a little tree. And so since, it, since we, Euro we, I'm not saying you, we Europeans have come, um, we have now uh, taken the best trees and left the little trees and we have inverted that forestal economy from incentivizing big trees, uh, or incentivizing little trees to incentivizing um, big trees. And so we have now run our forestal genetics into mongrelization over three centuries as we've taken the best and left the, and left the worst. What's exciting to us about all of this carbon-based uh, economy that you just saw, the composting, we have a chipper, we have a big uh, chipper, and we, we, we purchase chips on the open market. We actually compete with the, the, carbon, uh, you know, the carbon market in the area. And we use that in our composting program. We, we literally, you know, we do um, uh, thousands of tons of compost. Uh, with the pigs doing all that work, we're not turning it, we're not double handling it. We just handle it one time and, and use it. But if all the money spent on chemical fertilizers were instead spent on, um, on, on, on carbon, it would recreate this forestal economy 
where the diseased, the crooked, the weedy, and, 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 the, and the, the, the weak are weeded out, culled out, and that becomes our entire fertility base, and it generates fungi in the pasture instead of just bacteria, which you know creates a lot more microbial activity. And we now create not only an, an incentive to leave the best and take the worst, but we also have created a brand new uh, opportunity for vocations, for sacred, righteous, important vocations for all of the people in society who don't aspire to simply do the frenzied, harried uh, uh, Dilbert cubicle commute to town every day to sit in a cubicle punching numbers into cyberspace for a global company um, as their life's mission. A lot of business leaders are very concerned about what to do with the 40% of the population that still wants to get splinters and calluses and actually work with their hands. And, uh, and in, a, in, a, in an artificial intelligence uh, future and a service-oriented economy, um, creating noble sacred vocations for people who actually want to be cra do physical craft and artisanship is a, is a way to honor and respect the segment of society that is currently being marginalized in our, you know, in our climb to, uh, to, the, to the techno age. Um, you know, how, how, many, how many of you have ever been to a high school guidance counselor who said, you know, you're really smart, you should be a farmer. <laughs> okay. All right, so they're creating this uh, wonderful cathedral. All right, then we move to the, uh, to the cows. All right, so the cows, of course, have been marginalized uh, and demonized, um, if not close to criminalized now. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, flatulence and the burps of cows is, you know, destroying the planet. We need to get rid of them. And so I asked, what is the reason for an herbivore in nature? And if you look at herbivores in nature, you see three things. They are moving, they are mobbing, and they are mowing. Okay, moving, mobbing, mowing. Um, the reason for the herbivore is to prune the biomass back. Remember, of the three kinds of vegetation, trees, bushes, and grass, or forages, forages are the most efficient at converting sunbeams into biomass. In other words, they are the most uh, efficacious respirators in the system, inhaling carbon dioxide and exhaling oxygen, splitting off the carbon. And where does it go? Well, it goes in the plant, it goes in the soil, and that's your carbon sequestration. So, um, so if we really want to build soil, and that's why all the great soils on the planet, from the, the American Midwest to uh, the Pampas of Argentina, to the Serengeti of Africa, to the steppes of Mongolia, uh, the great soils on the planet are not under forests. They're under perennial prairies with herbivores. And because these are the most efficacious plants, to uh, create biomass out of sunbeams. And I like to use the word sunbeams because it's more poetical and, and the, the, children, the you know, stuff of children's books and fantasy. Solar energy sounds so you know, academic and sterile. So, so as a storyteller, I use sunbeams. And kids enjoy it a lot more too. So, uh, so, so the reason for the herbivore is as a pruner, just like a viticulturalist would prune a vineyard or an orchardist would prune an apple tree. So the herbivore prunes the biomass as it reaches senescence to restart that rapid so, um, sunbeam metabolism process. And they do it with moving, mobbing, and mowing. Mobbing, of course, is for predator protection. Moving is onto fresh ground all the time. And mowing, of course, is, as I've said, is pruning. And so the whole idea of the herbivore is, for our management, is matching the herbivore to this moving, mobbing, mowing sequence, this pattern, so that we can um, uh, use that animal in ecological uh, uh, progression. So if we, if we eliminate the moving, mobbing, and mowing, we have divorced the animal from this beautiful, ecologically synergistic system, and all sorts of dysfunction occurs. And that's, of course, what drives the, uh, you know, the, the, the cowspiracy documentaries and things like that, and of course is driving a lot of veganism and vegetarianism, is the data points from a completely dysfunctional system. If, if, if you, 
if you study a dysfunctional system as your benchmark of what is, you're going to be led to some crazy conclusions. And, uh, you know, it'd be like if we were from Pluto, you know, we sent a couple people down to study education on Earth. And, the, and so the two volunteers got in a flying saucer and came down to Earth and landed in the worst school district of the worst, with the worst superintendent, when, in the schoolyard of the worst school, uh, with the worst principal, and went to the classroom with the worst teacher and the worst students in the whole place and spent two days observing, went back to Pluto, they say, well, what do you, you find? And so, well, I think Earth would be better if they didn't have an educational system. <laughs> and that's what we've got with animal life, uh, agriculture right now, okay? So when it's functional, it's great. When it's not, it's not. So moving, mobbing, mowing, we move the cows every single day to a new paddock. And this does not take that much time. Uh, the cows, we move them about four o'clock every day. You know, animals love routine and so, um, so we, you know, we don't, we don't have to herd them, we don't have to drive them, we don't have to, you know, cowboy anything. We just roll up the electric fence. And the electric fence has allowed us, I hope you appreciate here, you know, here, here's where they were uh, three weeks ago, here's where they were yesterday, here's where they're going today. This creates a beautiful landscape mosaic that's easy to capture on a drone. It's, it's extremely, you know, visually beautiful. And the beautiful thing here is, that because, because they're moving uh, quilt-like across the landscape, only a little tiny piece is being impacted, being pruned at any one time. The rest of it is blossoming for pollinators. We've had a couple of uh, years of Smithsonian working landscape studies done at our farm, and our bird life pollinators are studying five benchmarks. Uh, all of them are just off the charts. Um, because there is, there is something always blossoming. There's always a food source. Uh, you know, meadow birds, all these things have nesting spots. It's amazing. So the mosaic creates a diversified uh, landscape. And uh, the beauty of this is we don't have to give up productivity to do this. Uh, we, uh, our county average is 80 cow days per acre. A cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. So all the food that you eat today, if you put it on a plate, that's one person day of food. Our, um, our county average is 80 cow days, so an acre will support 80 cows for a day a year, or one cow for 80 days a year. Everybody with me? Okay, and if you don't know the formula, it's cows times um, days divided by acres, cow days per acre. It's simple algebra. If you can't remember that, our gift shop sells t-shirts um, to, help, to help you remember. Um, uh, <coughs> This morning, Patrick came in from his morning run and he was wearing one of these formulas. I don't know if that's because you're promoting it or because you can't remember it, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, so so th this is the formula. And so, so the beauty of this is with the technology of electric fencing, uh, portable electric fencing, portable water systems, and portable shade structures. Uh, we, we run shade structures with these guys. We, we uh, make uh, nursery shade cloth uh, shade structures and, and we can move them along. So we have portable shade trees, portable water, and portable um, uh, control with electric fence. We can move these animals around the landscape with the same precision as you could mow with a zero turn mower on a golf course. Is that not cool? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now those cows are dropping a calling card that, uh, that encourages pathogenic activity and, and flies and all that stuff. So we look at that and say, well, goodness, before Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson and Merck Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Corporation came along, you know, what, what does nature do uh, to sanitize behind herbivores? And so we run chickens behind the cows. And, um, and uh, we run our egg mobiles behind the cows. The chickens then scratch through the cow patties and soon you can't even find them. And they, they turn all the fly uh, larvae into eggs, the grasshoppers and crickets into eggs. You can actually grow more animal protein per acre in insects than in meat and milk. And so this layers an additional income behind the cows that's just as valuable as the cows. So the cows are generating X per acre, the eggs generate X per acre. Acre. And so we're generating, you know, $100,000 worth of eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. That's called, in business circles, that's called a holon, holonic farming, where you're taking the waste stream and building another uh, enterprise using that waste stream. The question is, which would you rather live in or live next to? And so as we move into the future with our, with our uh, uh, benefits, um, 
we're, we're going to see more and more a shift to this kind of farming rather than that kind of farming. And I guarantee you, if you're a chicken, you'd much rather live in this environment than that one. So the eggmobiles are pasture sanitizers. The, um, now we move into uh, egg laying for pasture. This is the Millennium feather net. Uh, this is a skid structure. So it doesn't go down the road like the eggmobiles do. The eggmobiles can go, you know, they go up the road on um, rubber tires because um, they follow the cows everywhere. This is a standalone um, uh, portable infrastructure that we move every three days with a thousand chickens in it. Feed buggy in the front, chicken ladder, people ladder. But uh, we just move this every three days. So there's a 72 day rotation on a six acre uh, field, uh, three days per thousand birds and um, it really uh, it really works using high-tech electric netting so this is land intensive the eggmobile is land extensive um, uh, you know, two different models for two different objectives one is sanitation one is egg production um, then in the winter uh, they come into tall tunnels hoop houses um, you know and you can put pigs underneath we've got rabbits over here we've got you know uh, um, chickens on a mezzanine these are uh, eight by four foot tables that we can move in they're slats and so that can keep the chickens up away from the pigs the point is that you're using with rabbits pigs and chickens you're using the cubic space instead of just the linear space so none of the densities of the animals is at a point that that, that creates pathogenicity problems and you create confused pathogens confused pathogens are really good this is this is diametrically opposed to the linear reductionist uh, single species thinking of the current you know uh, industrial farming system uh, they go nuts over this oh aren't you you know concerned about contamination all this stuff no I'm concerned about pathogens that don't have to think and always have a host available uh, you know a, 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 a millimeter away to get to all right and so by creating more distance more space we have 40 percent pigs 40 percent chickens 40 percent rabbits 40 40 40 120 percent we're actually producing more per square foot than a factory situ than, than, a, than a typical single species situation but with none of the negatives because the uh, because none of the uh, the densities is at a point dense enough to kick in toxicity and pathogenicity when the animals come out they have debugged and fertilized in there and we can go in there with vegetables into the same structure bug free and um, and, and and pathogen free so about the time we start getting bugs in the plants the animals come in about the time we get bugs in the animals the plants come in are you with me so if you're going to use infrastructure you want to use multiple use infrastructure you want to use that infrastructure Structure for a lot of different things so we do uh, rabbits as well these are this is a hairpin okay hairpin has a slatted floor we use it as a mower around the orchard trees and you can run it through the vineyard and whatever and the rabbits you know one acre of grass put through rabbits is worth forty thousand dollars so um, you don't need a lot of land to make money farming. Uh, you just need to uh, think more creatively. Our problem is not money. Our problem is not resources. Our problem is creativity. Our weak link is always between our ears. As my son Daniel says, he says our, 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 our problem is constipation of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> then we move to, uh, to the chickens, the uh, broilers. These are uh, broiler shelters. Uh, they're, they're 10 feet by 12 feet by 2 feet high and uh, we move them across the pasture with a very simple dolly here. The chickens just uh, move on the ground to the next spot. They just walk as we move it along. One person in 60 minutes can move 5,000 chickens. They're, they're sheltered from weather. They're sheltered from predators. And so just with a, without starting a machine or anything, no more than that little dolly and a little bit of exercise, one person can move 5,000 uh, uh, chickens an hour. So it's extremely efficient and very protective of the birds from an animal welfare and a protection standpoint. So you get the, with the mobile infrastructure, you get the, the salad bar, the daily fresh moving salad bar, along with the protection that's critical uh, we do turkeys as well um, the turkeys uh, uh, this is a simple gobbledygo here 
Um, you know, it, it's as light as a wheelbarrow almost for 200 turkeys. We also have them for 400 uh, turkeys as well, but we just move them along. And uh, the, the turkeys, of course, they eat more grass and, and uh, they can, you know, uh, um, need a little more room to run. So we put them in the netting. Now the turkeys never get the electric net. They never understand what spark is. So there's a window of opportunity uh, to, to um, you know, uh, give, give them the net. It's about six to seven weeks when they're big enough that they can't go through the holes, but small enough that they won't walk over it because they never actually learn about the spark. Um, but but the, the, the turkeys are, are wonderful there as well. So we get a chicken that's uh, unbelievable in the world. Um, uh, pastured, I mean, the, the polyunsaturated fat is higher, the saturated fat's lower, the omega-3s are higher, the riboflavin, I mean, it's all different. Okay, so then we move into some of the uh, more uh, stuff that we're doing these days. Those are some of the, the basic prototypes. I haven't showed you all of them. I want to just zip through this very quickly. Um, so some of our most important work now, we feel like, is germinating young farmers. And so we run a very formal intern apprenticeship program. And uh, young people come in. And uh, this is uh, Nathan. Um, uh, he had no money, no land. And he proposed to us, how about letting me take one of your rental farms? I'll move your big uh, cow beef herd. And you, in exchange, give me enough acreage to start a little uh, raw milk herd share dairy and so we did he did and he's now out on his own farming full-time um, the beauty of these models is that they allow a person to go from zero to fully employed farming in 24 hours with no debt okay um, this is Ben well this isn't Ben but this is one of Ben's pigs and uh, Ben wanted to farm no money no land Okay, so we worked out a deal with the arra with arrangement with the neighbor, and uh, so he ferried pigs and ran chickens over on the neighbor's place. The neighbor was thrilled. He got brambles uh, turned into nice pasture. He got fertilizer on his fields. He didn't have to pay for, and Ben's full-time farming uh, pigs and chickens. Uh, Dan came to us. This isn't Dan. Uh, this is Dan's uh, mushroom, and Dan wanted to take over the gardens and do um, do shiitake mushrooms. Okay, good. So, so all of these things are totally independent entrepreneurial fiefdoms. They're not employees. Uh, nobody works by the hour. We don't. We have 20 people. Nobody works by the hour. Everybody's based on performance. And uh, so he did the shiitake mushrooms. Uh, Bree wanted to stay. She said, you know, you're not doing school tours. We need to do school tours. I love kids. Said, okay, Bree. Do it, and so we started. She started a business called Grass Stains Tours, and she layered um, uh, tours. And now we have thousands of urban kids that come out for farm tours. She does all the curriculum, does all the the marketing, does everything. We just take a little bit of royalty, but she gets the lion's share of it. And of course, all those kids go home with a little coupon to buy food for you know. It's a it's a it's a synergistic marketing outreach. So none of these young people had any money, had any land. And every one of them uh, full-time farming in 24 hours with no debt, building, building their own enterprises and their own entrepreneurial uh, options on our farm. Uh, one of the fun things we do is go to wellness fairs, uh, food fairs, and we cook sausages on site and uh, put them on toothpicks and hand them as samples to the children of vegetarians. <laughs> And uh, we've found, we, we've got a lot of uh, recovering vegetarians as customers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, the kids, the kids are not nearly as, uh, whatever, doped up on all the, you know, the, uh, uh, who was it yesterday told me they got a new name for vegetarian, it's called um, urban, urban disease. Urban, an urban disease. Yes, yeah, an urban disease. Anyway, um, but the kids, the, you know, the kids aren't all doped up on all the stuff the parents have been reading, but their, but their brain cells are struggling for nutrition, and so when they eat this stuff, they just, you know, uh, go nuts, and uh, so it's good stuff. Uh, we do uh, market to about 4,000 families in the urban sector through an online uh, shopping cart system. 
and we make uh, drop points and people uh, show up there to pick up their stuff. It's not a CSA. Uh, they have complete freedom of choice to buy what they want, but, uh, but, but we go into the city. We service about 50 restaurants so they can then take our story to their, to their restaurant. So I hope by now you're realizing this is an extremely people-centric operation. And, um, you know, this is, this is not what farmers typically, um, typically are, are good at. You know, we're, we're farmers because we don't like people. <laughs> and uh, so all this uh, marketing and people activity, if this doesn't float your boat, uh, what we're looking at is how to have partners that will, that will take this uh, story for us. And um, I'd love to do a full marketing seminar, but we'll have to do that another time. But the whole point is to actually get that retail dollar, wear the middleman hats very happily, and whatever pieces we don't, find a partner, a collaborator, who, who, who is willing to work on commission or on performance orientation, some sort of bonus arrangement, so that we can uh, have shared stakeholders and, um, and, and, uh, and, and create a team where one plus one equals three. At the end of the day, it's all about what do the kids want to do when they grow up? Because to me, ultimate regenerative agriculture is when the next generation takes over. And if we don't have farm models that will attract our best and brightest children, all the earthworms in the world and the soil building in the world and the actinomycetes and uh, animal welfare and everything else that we talk about doesn't make a hill of beans if the family doesn't enjoy it. And so that takes economic, emotional, and environmental support so that we can get to our dreams. I don't know what your dream is today, but I think if we continue to pursue truth, we'll find those dreams at the end of our rainbow. Okay, that's enough of an introductory context with a little bit of what we do. Now let me change gears here a little bit. I got, I, got, I got several gears here this morning. Okay, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit and um, deal a little bit with some of the, uh, the, buzz, the buzzwords we heard yesterday. So the first thing, well, we heard several things. One of the first things we heard was a celebration of where we've been for the, where we've come for the last 20 years. And one of the things that was celebrated was per capita expenditure on food has dropped from 30% to 12%. And this is really good. I would simply ask, well, what's the other 18% being spent on? Has anybody asked that? Healthcare. <laughs> That sounds like a good trade-off. I'd much rather buy cheap food and be sick <laughs> than buy expensive food and be well. Wouldn't you? Th th this is such a, well, I'll, I'll try to be diplomatic. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Great Britain after all. Um, you know, in, in America, in the last 30 years, we've exchanged 18% capita expenditure on food and 9% on health care to 9% on food and 18% on health care. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a good trade to me. And so to just stand up here and celebrate, well, we're spending a lot less on food, it has no context. Are you with me? It's, it's, it's a completely uh, spurious um, uh, point. Uh, it assumes that cheap food is good and other expenditures I mean, yeah, the cheap food is good and other expenditures are better. I mean, that, that, that's the assumption. Um, you know, the, uh, the Bible says it will be destroyed by vain philosophy. And so what I want to do here is zero in on some of the background philosophy of this stuff. Because, boy, you start, you know, trading, I'll, I'll trade you a dollar for two, you know, playing a big, it's like we're playing some sort of a big monopoly game. And... Um, and I think it's important to drill down into the background assumptions, the paradigms behind these assumptions because they are deadly. Uh, a cheap food policy does not give us a good food policy. That's a fact. 
And I would suggest that, uh, that if, we, if we had a value system that rewarded better food, um, uh, we would have a better system and we would have better caretaking of our air, soil, and water, our, our commons. Number two, she said 50% of British households are on an austerity budget. Well, I'm not a British household, but I'm on an austerity budget. Um, and it, th this, this, this just uh, to throw out this thing that 50% are on austerity budget um, just assumes that everyone who is financially stressed is a victim of something beyond their control. Um, and you know, it begs the question, is it possible that anyone who's financially stressed is responsible for financial, financial distress? I mean, really? Can, you know, it, could it be that some of these folks are spending money frivolously or not saving money? Or maybe they're just not good with money and they need to learn a new set of budgeting. Um, but, you know, to just, to just assume that since 50% are struggling financially, we need to make sure they have cheap food doesn't penetrate to all the context of why 50% of people, maybe, maybe it's because they're being overtaxed <laughs> in order to uh, give money to parasites. Thirdly, she said a country that can't feed itself ceases to be a country. Now that's an interesting statement. A country that can't feed itself ceases to be a country. And then about two minutes later, she said that Great Britain imports 50% of its human and animal feedstocks. Well, apparently Great Britain is no country. <laughs> so my question is, why worry about exports? Yeah. 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 Let's just feed ourselves. <laughs> I mean, think about the gymnastics, the policy gymnastics being done to sell to, you know, Argentina or Sri Lanka or whatever and I'm a firm believer I've traveled a lot around the world and, and uh, I'm a firm believer I, I agree with her I think that a country that can't feed itself isn't I think that is a, 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 a in general a, a positive a right a correct statement but if that's the case just let's hoe our own garden who cares about world standards? Just feed yourself. Number four, we should only help efficient business. Now, this is a good one. We should only help efficient business. You know, um, it's interesting. She said we should only help efficient business, but then doesn't make the, con the, the, the connection to inefficient money management for people who are financially distressed. In other words, all the people who are in poverty are victims. But inefficient farmers are not victims. Are, are you with me? This is, this is called, in debate, this is called intellectual schizophrenia. <laughs> okay? And uh, I would just suggest that efficiency is not nearly as important as effectiveness. The problem is she's confusing efficiency with effectiveness. You know, you can be really efficient about the wrong things. Uh, Stan Parsons, the founder of the uh, Ranching for Profit Schools, says we've become incredibly adept at hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. <laughs> you know, does anybody go in uh, to surgery and your last uh, question to the doctor is, are you efficient? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Um, you know, my brother is an airplane mechanic. He's a certified AP, uh, airframe power plant, uh, airplane mechanic. And growing up, he was always the one that fixed the stuff that I broke. And because um, I'm a, you know, choleric, let's get her done, uh, you know, cut the tree and ask if we should, should have cut it later, that sort of thing. And, uh, and so, so uh, anyway, this was, this was always a joke. If you wanted something done, get me to do it, and, and uh, 
uh, my brother could, could fix it. And so this is an ongoing thing. And, 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 and um, now, you know, he says, and, and people still joke about, you know, how I'm, I'm always in a hurry and he never is in a hurry. And he just looks at them and grins and says, when I'm fixing your airplane, you want me to be in a hurry? <laughs> you know, efficiency, uh, efficiency in and of itself is, a, is, is an extremely subjective idea, okay? Um, uh, besides, this is a very, it's a very uh, clever way to insinuate that if you don't agree with me, you're not efficient. Um, you know, she's talked about her, I need 100% of my cows to be bred. I don't want 100% of my cows to be bred. You know, it takes, it costs as much, it costs as much to go from 85 to 95% conception. That 10% costs as much as going from zero to 85%. My cows work for me, I don't work for my cows. And so, um, anybody that's asking for 100% bred cows uh, is losing money. What you want is balance. Nothing, nothing is efficient when it's floored. Not a race car, not your car, not anything. It's never, uh, it's never most efficient. You're looking for that sweet spot of balance, fuel efficiency, you know, where it's everything's purring. You know, a jet doesn't, a jet doesn't run in takeoff mode all the time. If it ran in takeoff mode, it could actually get where you're going a lot faster. Well, a lot more wear and tear on the engine. Are you with me? Efficiency is a, is a highly subjective term. Next, she said, we all have the right to nutritious, affordable food. Now, I know some of you are gonna, this is American, I'm not sure about this guy. You know, when we say everybody has a right to, we, we throw that phrase around, and I wanna dissect that a minute, okay? So I'm going into Washington a couple, you know, a while back, riding in the metro, and a guy comes in, sits next to me, he's 400 pounds, he's got a pack of cigarettes in his pocket, you know, a, 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 like a two kilo soda pop that he's guzzling, and a, and a bushel basket size of Dorito potato uh, chips. Is it too unloving to say, <laughs> I'm sitting there and thinking, and people think I am supposed to be responsible for his health? That's an insult. That's an offense. I mean, even in the Bible it says if a man doesn't work, doesn't labor, neither should he eat. Well, in the, in the American Declaration it says, unalienable. Now, everybody reads that inalienable. It's not inalienable. It's unalienable. A lien is what a banker or a lender puts on your property until you pay the mortgage, right? That's a lien. And so unalienable rights are rights that no power, no king, no parliament, no congress, no president, they are rights that nobody can put a lien on you for. They are part of your humanness, part of being a part of the human family, okay? And so there really aren't very many of these. Um, the right to have your property protected, that somebody doesn't come and take your stuff. That's one. What Whatever your stuff is, if, it only, if all you have is a pencil, but your pencil... Nobody has, why? Why is that such an important right? Because how we steward our possessions is a measure of our character, okay? And if, and if we don't have anything, we're not responsible for any stewardship, okay? The right to worship as we please. The right to speak and not be throttled in our, in our speech. And you don't have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater, all right? Hear somebody push back on that real quickly. But, but these, are, these are rights. These, these are basic 
human expression rights. They're, ob they're obligatory on society to provide <coughs> or your actual humanness is not able to be exercised. Does everybody follow me? So when we throw around right to this right, you've got to be careful, okay? I mean, because if I have a right to food, well, then I probably need to have a right to a car so I can get to work. And I need a right to an iPhone so I can uh, take my class at the college and communicate with the professor. And I have a right to a, to a, a, a stenographer's pad so I can take notes in class. I can't do it. Are, are you with me? You, when you start flippantly throwing around rights, you better, you better be really careful about cheapening real rights with a plethora of fake rights. Are you with me? So, that, there, that you have, because you're human, that you don't have to do anything to have it. Okay? Um, next, we're trading one protectionist scheme for another. Well, I would just ask, do we really need protection? Um, all protection comes with a price. There was a famous American founder named Ben Franklin. And one of his famous uh, lines was, anyone who's willing to trade freedom for security gets neither. You know, we, 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 we assume that farming can't be a viable business. And, and I... Um, I disagree with that. And I, and I don't think that land ownership is necessary for farming. Um, but all protection comes with a price. Um, if we're going to protect something, let me go where angels fear to tread here. If we're going to protect something, how about protecting the right of neighbor to neighbor freedom of food choice to participate in food commerce neighbor to neighbor as voluntary consenting adults without a bureaucrat getting involved? <laughs> You know, we, um, if, if we're going to, now I'm not saying that we should be able to export without regulations or put it in all these without re regulations or whatever. I'm just saying, if I want to come to your farm, ask around, look around, smell around, and as a voluntary consenting adult exercise my freedom of choice, and these are powerful words today. I mean, we, we're in the time of choice, right? Where we're all, you know, we're all free to make choice. Choices where we're free as a, as a, a driverless car and a train and a trackless train, um, and we we can make all these uh, choices. Um, but when it comes to food, you know, if I want a glass of raw milk, I can't get it. If I want my neighbor's charcuterie, if unless it's gotten through you know five inspections, I can't get it. If I want my neighbor's uh, pot pie that they made in their kitchen, and people talk about food deserts, you know, food insecure places. Listen, a lot of these food deserts are urban, are urban fragmented areas where there is land available. Just imagine, you can't, you can't uh, uh, food bank your way out of, uh, out of food deserts. Just imagine if a, if, if a single mom of four, let's take a pretty you know, rough situation of a poverty-stricken person, um, single mom of four says, hey, you know, we've got a vacant lot right next door. I could put a garden in there, have a couple of rabbits and chickens and make, uh, and make nice uh, pot pies and uh, um, uh, quiche, you know, for my, for my neighbors. And so she puts in her garden, her kids help her, and they, you know, put this thing together and they make a nice pot pie and they go knock on the neighbor's door and you know to, to sell this pot pie and the neighbor says oh man that smells good man I want this this is great uh, maybe she had them over for dinner and they had one the week before and said this is so good I want would you make them for me to buy well sure you know so she does this within 30 minutes of launch there's gonna be five bureaucrats pounding on her door saying where's your license where's your business license where's your fire extinguisher on the wall this is not a commercial district it's a residential and we know we don't want to integrate our work and our our, our, uh, our living uh, and we can't have the butcher baker and candlestick maker embedded in the city that'll never do we've got to have the commercial district the residential district the retail district you know and and so we've got to segregate society we can't afford to have integration and um, and, and, and there would be, you know, five things that she would have to try to try to do. And so, um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm not wanting to debate no regulations, okay? But I am suggesting that there has to be a place for 
embryonic entrepreneurial market access. Okay? A place. Define it where you want it. To me, the easiest is neighbor to neighbor. Okay? And if we just start there, it's a good place to start. Let's protect that, okay? Next, she said, horticulture at the, uh, at the farm gate has not had a price increase in 15 years. And then a minute later, she said, Aldi is putting in 200 more stores. And this is the phrase, there is a savage war on price. That was an interesting use of words. Savage, and she's talking about, remember, she's talking about food. Now, she's talking about food that everybody has a right to that's nutritious and affordable, that sounds so warm and fuzzy. And then on a breath later, there's a savage war on price. <laughs> Am I missing something here? Okay. So, this savage war on price. So how does the farm gate price going to change? You know, it's interesting. You know, there, there, was no, there was no indication that that price was going to change. Here's the thing you have to understand. The farmer is the only one in the food chain who can absorb asset reduction. One of the most interesting books on my shelf is a book called Vertical Diversification, written in 1950 by D. Howard Doan. He started Dome Management Services. There were a, he was actually Undersecretary of Agriculture in like 1910, okay? At the end of his life, people said, you know, could you codify everything that you've learned, you know, about the farm business? And he wrote this book, Farm uh, Vertical Diversification. And the whole, it, it, it's, it's the first major, a farmer needs to be value-added, direct marketing and value-adding it. And, and when he wrote it in 1950 in the U.S., I mean, he's got pictures in there of people that are, are canning pickles in their home kitchen and, and sending them, shipping them through the postal service to urban customers by the box. Butchering chickens in the backyard and making, you know, broth. And I mean, it's really cool. Um, all stuff that would be illegal today. But anyway, what he, he makes the point that you know, when the, when, the, uh, when the distribution company, you know, uh, DHL, FedEx, Amazon, Com, whatever, wh they can't afford to run bald tires on their truck. When those tires need to be replaced in order to get that truck inspected as a commercial vehicle, they need, they need to, 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 to put those tires on the truck, okay? When they make payroll and they pay their employees, they can't tell their employees, hey, you know, I just, I just can't make payroll this week. Uh, you'll have to work for nothing. <coughs> and, but the farmer, the farmer can work for no pay. He can go get a job in town to support his farm addiction. <laughs> right? The farmer can work for no pay. The farmer can deplete the soil. You know, when, when the distribution vehicle needs gas in the tank, uh, they have to put gas in the tank. All right? They can't run on empty. You know, when the engine blows, they got to fix the engine. All right? But a farmer can deplete his soil and put off fertility for a while. A farmer can defer maintenance. Well, we won't paint the barn this year. We won't fix those shingles this year. You know, um, we, we, we won't replace the tractor this year. A farmer can use unsafe equipment. Okay? And so the farmer is the only one in the, in the value chain that can actually defer all these costs. Everything else, they don't. And so I would ask, what is your doable practical proposal to change the fact that this farm gate price is not going up? And I suggest, I suggest bypassing Aldi. What's wrong with us just building a separate system? What does this separate system look like? Electronic aggregation. That's the, that's the new business operative term, electronic aggregation. Bricks and mortar 
Retail interface is becoming more and more expensive. You got to have, you know, you got to have handicap parking. I'm not against handicap. I'm just telling you, you got to have, you got to have, you got to have the retail inter, and you've got, you know, huge liability insurance. What if somebody slips on the curb and breaks their back? You know, there's all this stuff. But in electronic aggregation, you don't have any of that liability because the product is aggregated in an electronic interface. Okay. And this allows us to sell the benefits that those of us here want to sell. We can use social media to tell our stories and it lets folks withdraw from the current paradigm. Maybe we don't need 200 more Aldi's. Maybe what we need are 200 more um, uh, farm urban electronic interfaces, okay, to move product. And I know we're going to hear more later today from that kind of thing, so I'm just laying a little bit of foundation. So we can build direct connections with customers, education, information, all the things that we, that we do. So um, I, I just suggest that we need to offer uh, uh, maybe a, a parallel system and just, just create an, uh, an, an other kind of system. Just does just not even have a supermarket. I mean, in America, we didn't have a supermarket until 1946. We survived pretty good without one for a long time. We don't need them anymore. Uh, we just build an alternative. I mean, my, my, my son and daughter-in-law. I mean, they get they, they not get toilet paper from Amazon. You know, it, it comes delivered to their doorstep. They don't have to go to the store to get toilet paper. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> and she said the main thing to treat is to treat the British agriculture as a business. I would just say that sometimes the moral track record of our businesses is not very good. And, and just to assume that business is positive is not good. There are some really terrible businesses like the human trafficking business. Okay, I mean, these are all businesses. And just to assume that business has some sort of a moral, you know, a wonderful thing if we just treat it like a business, um, it doesn't mean anything. Next she said, nitrogen from the cow is the same as from a bag. <laughs> I was sitting up here and I could feel the, <laughs> I could feel the gas pedal come up on that one, you know, like the brake. <laughs> 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 Well, it's empirically not true because the urea in urine from a cow has one more neutron in the molecule than the urea in the laboratory. We have not been able to make urea with that extra neutron. Now, what's the reason for that? What's the importance of that other neutron? Anybody here know why we have, why urea from the cow has that other neutron? Anybody? I don't either. <laughs> So it doesn't matter, does it? No. Those of us in this room, we know that there's a fearfully wonderful maidenness about creation, about the world around us. We're, we're, we're constantly, aren't we? We're amazed at the, the secret life of plants, the secret life of the soil, the, 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 the relational, the, the communication of the actinomycetes, the mycorrhizae, the gibberellins, and making the, you know, glomalin. And I mean, it, man, this whole thing is just pulsing with sentience, understanding. Life is just vibrant all around us. And to just, to just dismiss that neutron as if, well, I don't understand it, I don't know it, so I guess it's not important, is the height of hubris. Besides, that bag doesn't give us a lot of other benefits that the cow gives us. People say, well, cows are inefficient. Yeah, of course they're inefficient. That's why they build soil. If they were as efficient as a squash plant, they wouldn't build any soil. The saliva from the cow acts as a salve covering, throwing a bunch of microbes and salve on the grass plant when it's sheared so that it actually stimulates growth. You don't get that out of the bag. Next, she says, we need to be precision farmers. This is another code word, another code word. It's a code word for everything else is imprecise. You know, compost is imprecise. 
When I spread compost, that's imprecise. You're just, you're just throwing it out there. You're not putting a little dab of, of intravenous chemical on the potato. <laughs> and viewing farming this way, it eliminates the art of farming. Anyone here who's a farmer, you know that we can't precisely do everything. Okay? You can be precisely wrong. Okay? There's nothing about precision that's actually uh, right. I mean, can you imagine going to an artist, you know, and they're painting? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure you're, you know, was Van Gogh precise? No. There's a lot more than precision. And finally, the last one, science-based. Boy, that's a red flag. Science-based. Again, the implication is, if you don't agree with me, you're not science-based. You know, as if, as if science can empirically measure everything. Well, it can't. There's a lot of my life that's not science-based. The stuff that's most meaningful to me is immeasurable because you can't measure the heart. Okay? So to just say we're going to, we're going to reduce everything biologically to science and to uh, measurable empirical stuff is just is to deny the heart and the emotion of what we do number three very quickly very quickly benchmarks of truth number one this is this is we we created this on our farm as we were struggling with with what is what is our truth what if we, if we could measure, what we're looking for is we're looking for a compass, a compass, true north. We want true north here so as we make decisions and as we're tempted to do things, whether it's to buy something, to, to uh, grow something, to develop a market, to whatever our policy is, what is a benchmark of truth that keeps us from veering to one side or the other? So here's 10, very, very quickly. Number one, does it build soil? In my view, everything, science-based, efficiency, you know, uh, uh, farm gate price, all this stuff, if it doesn't build soil, it's not acceptable. You know, when's the last time somebody went in for, to the banker for a business loan and the banker says, ooh, boy, this is a good business plan. I think you're going to be a millionaire. In fact, you're going to be a millionaire uh, so much that I want to be your partner. But before I loan you a million dollars, well, uh, pounds, um, uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, what is this business going to do to the earthworms in our community? <laughs> Has anybody ever asked that? Of course not. Of course not. And so I would suggest that, that um, any model, anything that we do has to, that, that becomes a, that, that's a standard. Are you building soil or not building soil? And if it's not building soil, it's not acceptable. It's not, it's not truth. Um, and the beautiful thing that we as farmers can, can, can enhance this through carbon centricity, through grazing management, through all the things that, we're, that we know now that we can do, um, we have this idea that, that uh, environmentalism requires abandonment. The only way to actually be environmentally sensitive is to get people off, you know, don't desecrate the land with human breath, you know. Because as we look back through the annals of human history, what we see is a lot of uh, ec ecological destruction, correct? So let's repent in sackcloth and ashes. Yes, my ancestors did this, I'm sorry, I repent. But that doesn't mean the answer is, I'm no longer gonna participate. And so what I'm proposing is environmentalism by participation. And that's the joy of my life that I can walk out the back door every day into a nest of abundance that is not a reluctant stepsister that I've got to hog, you know, get in a half Nelson, I'm going to make you do this for me and grow this for you know, as if, as if nature is some sort of a reluctant partner. No, nature is a benevolent lover to be caressed. How do I caress? Build soil. Number two, is it child-friendly? Child-friendly. 
Does it captivate the imagination of the child? Is it a place where child children want to be? Another way to say this is it aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. If our farm stinks, if it's ugly, if we bring kids from the city and go to the farm and, and every little thing there's ooh and there's yeah and yeah, yeah. That's, that's, not, that's not acceptable, okay? For farm kids, it's got to be emotionally enjoyable, not embarrassing. It's got to be economically enjoyable, growing salaries, stacking, on, stacking uh, businesses. It's got to be ecologically enjoyable for kids. The mystery, the beauty, the awesomeness to be able to, uh, awesomeness to, be able to come around a corner and see a, you know, a nesting bird. Child-friendly. My favorite sign I've seen recently was in Australia. I went to a farm and they had a sign at the, at the farm gate that looked like a no trespassing sign as I got up closer to it where I could read it. It said, trespassers will be impressed. <laughs> Is that not cool? We have one now at our farm. I hope they don't have a copyright on it. I didn't ask permission. Number three, benchmark of truth, being honoring. All right, does it honor the being? In other words, does it honor the pigness of pigs? Does it honor self-actualization? Uh, 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 does, it, does it honor the, the tomato? You know, we, we have, we have uh, our, our tomato cultivars for the last, whatever, 40 years have been chosen not on the basis of nutrition, not on the basis of taste. They've been chosen on shipability. And when you choose tomatoes on the basis of the fact that they can, you know, rattle around in the back of a truck for 500 miles as your, you know, your, your, your genetic selection process, what are you going to get? You're going to get cardboard. And then you're going to get kids that don't like vegetables. Yes. I guess actually tomato is a fruit, isn't it? That's, that's always a big mistake. But you get what I'm saying, okay? Now, why don't kids like this stuff? Because there's no taste. Because we have not honored the, ace, the essence, the sacredness, the, the, the phenotypical expression of that sacred thing. Number four, equity is immaterial. Equity is immaterial. Stay with me here. What we're looking for is that we want a why more than a how. And in our technocentric cultures in the Western world, we have become extremely good at tearing things apart, compartmentalization, separation, disconnection, and technically building and creating and innovating things on the how. We have not been good at asking why. The problem is that you and I are so clever, we're able to innovate beyond our physical, mental, spiritual, emotional capacity to metabolize what we've innovated. So we innovate things and the next thing you know, we spend three generations trying to remediate the damage that our innovation did. Okay, so we want to have our equity primarily in knowledge, skill, and patrons. Knowledge, skill, and patrons, not in just infrastructure. Number five, does it empower innovation? Does it empower innovation? Okay, you know, we're hardwired for negative. Negative's easy. It's easy to complain. You know, who has come back from town saying, hey honey, I just went through five go lights. <laughs> we don't call them go lights, we call them stop lights. Why? Because we remember what stops us, not what makes us go. And so, when we talk about empowering innovation, what we mean is that the whole, what we want is a model, and when we talk about future of, of British Ag policy, what we want is a model that empowers innovation, empowers diversity, empowers a lunatic fringe. 
Hold gently to your orthodoxy du jour. Okay? All right? Because when we look at innovation, it's always out there on the fringes. It's always. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, Gandhi said, uh, you know, uh, in any movement, uh, at first they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Where are we in this food movement? I think this New York Times soil piece shows they're not ignoring us anymore. I think it shows that they're not laughing at us anymore. I think we're in the... They fight you. So in the, in the fight, in the fight, remember what the next step is. We win because truth wins. Okay? You know, the Romans had this idea. They had this idea that you could tell the strength of a civilization by the number of laws that it had. I mean, God only needed ten. Okay? <laughs> Pretty simple. All right? And, and, and they said that what happens is as a, as a society weakens, it makes more and more laws because that's all they can do. We can't fix anything, but we can, we can sure legislate it. And so more and more laws are created. And as we create more laws, they reduce the ability of innovators to access the market. Okay? Many of us here are struggling with the fact that we can't, that we can't bake bread at home and sell it to a neighbor. We can't make pepperoni at home and sell it to a neighbor or sausages or whatever. And it takes a $500,000 quintuple permitted, uh, you know, million dollar facility to sell one bucket full of stuff. All right. So all of our regulations need to be uh, scale uh, uh, independent. Number six, it increases the comments. By this, I mean everybody can do it. I call this a whosoever will benchmark of truth. Okay. Um, the, the question is, you know, can everyone do this? Um, it, it, it's ultimately additive rather than extractive. Okay. It builds community um, and runs on trust. It increases the comments. Number seven, um, it's easy to enter and easy to exit. You see, the reason the average farmer is 60 years old is because when the impediments are to entry are so high that young people can't get in, old people can't get out. Okay? So both generations are stuck. So to have multi-generational, low capitalization, lower threshold things is, you know, is critical. Which is why on our farm, we have mobile, modular, management intensive infrastructure. I hope seeing the slides here, you noticed, wow, first of all, all of our infrastructure is mobile, okay? Now, mobile infrastructure has only been enabled in recent, in recent times. You couldn't have mobile infrastructure 100 years ago because our building materials, we, we, we didn't have erector sets to be able to build on, uh, you know, structures. Now we've got rubber tires, we've got axles, we've got bearings, we've got, we've got uh, a bandsaw mill so we can mill, you know, half inch by one inch lath, all right? You couldn't do that a hundred years ago when your girth was three eighths of an inch and you, you know, if you milled lath, all you had was a big pile of sawdust and a little stack of boards at the end of the day. So you couldn't build stuff out of tinker toys and erector sets. Today, with our modern technology and spun woven polyethylene fibers and stuff, we can make now very simple mo uh, mobile infrastructure. And that allows us to eliminate owning the land because mobile infrastructure can be placed anywhere. Land you own, land you rent, land you squat on or whatever. It's modular, modular, which means you can add modules as your cash flows, instead of having to build a $500,000 facility to grow one chicken or one pig or whatever, or milk one gallon of milk, instead, you can start with modules, and if you like it, then you can add modules and scale. And, find, and, uh, and then it's management intensive, which substitutes capital intensity for people. So it's, we, we substitute um, capital intensity, energy intensity, pharmaceutical intensity for people, which moves our equity from physical depreciable infrastructure to non-physical skill, information, and customers. And there's not a banker in the world who's ever come to you and said, I'm going to foreclose on your skills. 
Okay, or I'm going to repossess your information. Number eight, eight benchmark of truth. It's consistent across all fields, spiritual, ethical, economic, and ecological. So if it violates, if it, if it violates belief, if it violates ethics, if it violates economics, if it violates ecological, any one of those is a failure. And what this means is that we're, that we're uh, moving toward a system based on faith, not fear. So much of what we do is a defensive measure against what we fear instead of, instead of just going out here and visioning what do we vision for the future, what, what's, what's our vision, and then building positively in faith for that. Number nine, it's appropriate and viable in both developed and undeveloped countries, rich and poor countries. All right. Um, uh, you know, a, a, an example of this is uh, compost. Compost is, is, is viable and, and affordable and doable. Uh, whether you use a machete or whether you use a pigerator or a compost turner, it's equally viable across all rich and poor cultures. Whereas chemicals, chemicals impoverish and impoverish farmers. Are you with me? Um, this is why, you know, grass-finished beef is so good. All right, and finally, number 10, number 10, benchmark of truth, it scales both up and down. It is not scale prejudicial, okay? Profitability is not size dependent. And this is where a lot of our, you know, regulatory structure comes in because it is scale prejudicial. Uh, I was just in Austria and listened to a farmer talk about how um, in Austria the, the EU subsidies for farmers kick in at, uh, at two hectares. Well, he has a one hectare market garden. Now, a two and a half acre market garden is a pretty big, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Ben Hartman in Ohio makes $150,000 a year on a, you know, a, a, a 0.9 acre Farm, hundred fifty thousand dollars on a one point five, one point nine. I mean, I'm sorry, a point nine acre farm. That'd be like a what you know, a point three hectare farm. And uh, and but but what happens is because the subsidies are scale prejudicial, he now has to compete with a neighbor that happens to have two hectares, who can get all the subsidies, and he can't get one. Because he's not considered, he's not big enough to be a farmer. Are you with me? So, so truth is about scale independence. So it works for big guys and little guys. And that creates a whosoever will option. Okay? Bitch marks of truth. I'll quit there. I'll do, I'll do my blessing at the end, but right now, I think we'll take some questions. Do we have a couple minutes? Yes. We'll, a couple minutes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we've got, if we slightly go into the coffee break, we'll, we've got a little bit more than that. Uh, okay. I just want to say one thing about Minette. What was powerful about her being mm -hmm. here was she's, very, she's a politician, right. actually, right. and she was listening and she experienced the force of the collective imagination and intuition and innovation that is represented here. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and, and in no way am I trying to demean her. She, she but, but, but the, uh, she's absolutely well, well intentioned and, and unlike many of, many of my kind of, you know, uh, organic farming friends, they don't like that I'm not willing to say it's a conspiracy, you know, from, no, it's not a conspiracy. It's a, it's a fraternity of ideas that we're dealing with, okay? Yeah. Wonderful, sincere hearted people, you know, um, but but our, our paradigms are, are we're, we're you know it's like Mars and Venus okay we're, we're on and, and and here but, we, but maybe not here, even here, we, here here we are um, uh, you know she actually came here instead of ignoring us or laughing at us and and here we are at this point and so um, so we need to again be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves, right? As we move forward and um, and realize that we, if we do get in the driver's seat, we need to we need to not be sitting here managing demons, but managing vision. Yes, because the plastic 
transition. I don't know how aware you are yes. of David Attenborough's Blue Planet and the impact that it's yes. had. Yes. It's it's changed everything. Right. And I feel that we might be closer than we think in, on on the land based crisis. We may tipping tipping points are interesting, aren't they? Yeah. The study of tipping points, and I mean I mean think about think about Airbnb. Who would have guessed twenty years ago that an electronic interface could create more rooms than Marriott, Hilton, and Sheraton combined worldwide in two years without picking up a hammer yeah. and a nail. So, <laughs> so to, to you, um, maybe we have, try, try to keep them tight just because we haven't got time, but you can speak to Joel through the rest of the day, but who would like to make a point or ask a question? Joel? Um, We've had someone ask a question, a question from Madrid. We've had people all around our audience uh, asking questions. There's one in particular that we flagged up. Um, I was just in Madrid last week. <laughs> so, yeah. You're wearing off over there as well, it's amazing. <laughs> so how, how do you advise we motivate and support farmers to move in this direction? Uh, with that in mind, um, do you support the measurement of public goods? And if so, what do you measure at Polyface Farm? Uh, a question is, do we measure public good? What do we measure at Polyface Farm? Um, okay, so um, there, are, there are numerous ways you can measure. Our, my favorite way to measure is um, earthworms, vegetation, uh, biodiversity. I mean, when we, when we start seeing, when we came in 61 and it was a rock pile and a gully ditch, I grew up, I, I never saw a turkey. Now, I see turkeys almost every day. They're just everywhere, okay? Wild turkeys, all right? Uh, now, the industry views that as an avian influenza vector, okay? You know, listen, when, when your paradigm views wildlife as a, as a threat, that's an incorrect paradigm, okay? And so, uh, so you know, we're, we're pretty, I, I, you know, let me just admit, we're pretty seat of the pants at our place. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're really in tune with it, I think. We, we watch the earthworm castings, um, and if we're growing earthworms, a lot of things are, a lot of things are working well. But you haven't, apart from the Smithsonian study, oh, have you got we, a, yes, a, an we, across the board valuation? We, do. we, we, we have, an, a, we have a, a numerous evaluations. I mean, we, anyone that wants to come and study things, we give them the freedom. So we had a UNC vet student that came and they wanted to know what our soil salmonella loads were because we've been pasturing these chickens for 50 years compared to a farm that hadn't had a chicken for 50 years and amazingly found our load was zero different than theirs, which is a confirmation that our rest period is right. So how do we how do we know the size of our shelters and how many chickens to put in and how long the rest period is? So we know how much nitrogen a chicken is giving. We know generally how much the soil and the climate in our area can metabolize. Okay? And we know how much grain land is required to feed the chickens in the shelter. And We've tried different sizes and we found the sweet spot where if we, if we put fewer in, they don't do as well. And if we put too many in, they don't do as well. And what's interesting is the sweet spot of performance, that balance, the amount of land to grow the grain to feed the birds in the shelter, the amount of nitrogen going on and phosphorus and stuff from the chickens in the manure load, all of those things intervene at our density and rest period. But so, so when you have that many things intersecting, you can be pretty sure you're somewhere close to being right. But let's build on this question. The farm bill at the moment is helping perpetuate a, a system which is running out of time. Mm. Uh, there's a discussion going on about crop insurance where it could be related to soil fertility. What, if, if you're measuring the public goods which are coming from your farm, how can we make the system that's operating your farm become the norm in the United States and, and beyond? Through intervention from Sonny Perdue and, and others. Um, if well, we're right that it's the change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, uh, this, 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 this is where you and I always have our little bit of, uh, little bit of, of tension uh, because I'm a libertarian. <laughs> And, uh, and so, so the, the, the way I say to move forward is freedom rather than top down. I, I want to free up the market so that I could smoke bacon at my house and sell it to a neighbor that wants it. If, if I could do that, 
we would run circles around the industrial food so system. So is it only just relaxation of some of these regulatory burdens that you want? Well, well for, me, for me, yeah, that's my, that's my biggest hurdle because it keeps me from being able to access people. We've got customers that are dying for, uh, you know, a pot pie, uh, you know, chicken broth, things like that. And, and, and unless we go to an off-site because we're an agricultural zone, so you can't have a commercial kitchen on a farm because that's that's manufacturing, and manufacturing is not consistent with the agricultural zone. So we have all this segregated kind of stuff. If if we could just if we could just access our neighborhood with value-added product easily, okay, okay uh, it, it, we we would be able to spin circles around uh, the industry. When I wanted to come to the farm um, as, a, as, a, as an 18 year old, when I wanted to come to the farm back full time, we were milking about, we were milking two Guernsey cows and I figured out that I could hand milk 10 cows and sell the milk at retail price. Not, not high because it's grass, not, or, I mean this is before the O word was widely used. And, uh, and, and, and I realized I could hand milk 10 cows, sell it to the neighbors and make a good living only problem was it was illegal, and I've never gotten over it. I've never gotten over that that it didn't matter that I wanted to do it and that my neighbors wanted it. All right, I'm not trying to be Russian roulette in food safety. I'm just saying that somewhere embryonic entrepreneurial access needs to be available so that innovation around the edges can be started without five hundred thousand dollar twin tuple paperwork uh, licensing. And, 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 then, and then you can build a little successful business and then you invest in infrastructure and, you know, other things. So that's, uh, we've, got to, we've, we've yeah. got to stop very soon, so we're going to take at least okay. two more questions. Uh, yeah. Maybe, please. Hello, Joel. John Hatton, the Upper State in Essex. The last 40 years, we've seen farms get bigger with fewer people on board working land. The average age is now 59, 60. Yes, they were told we can't have a 20-year goal, we need it now, today, but we have to have that 20-year vision. What is that vision? What, if you think it's 59 now, 60, what would you like to see it in 20 years' time, and what steps do we need to take now to get to that? Elevator years? pitch, please. Elevator pitch? Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is everything relates to everything, right? Uh, Okay, so so my my look the the bit the business uh, axiom for healthy in, uh, economic sectors is 35. The average age of the practitioner in that sector, 35 years old. That is a vibrant sector. If it's over 35, by business definition, it's it's in decline. And so that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see um, I'd like to see it 35, average. Can you make them really quick? Just we'll really, take them four. You, you said 80 cow days for the farms around you. What are you achieving? Who else? Uh, 80 cow days, the farm around us, we're doing 400 cow days. Next. Um, I, I'm slightly scared to ask this question, but Bill Gates and others are investing in meat that can be grown in factories, um, not sentient animals. Um, you obviously have some interesting views on vegetarians, which is why I'm scared of asking the question. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And is that actually one of the biggest threats to our businesses in the next 30 years? No. Again, I I don't think um, I don't think creating policy to fight against the threat of veganism, vegetarianism. Uh, I, I think it's a fad, and uh, it doesn't taste good at all. <laughs> and, and and it has none of these benefits. Again, I mean, the, this New York. Listen, this thing starts. This thing. The second paragraph goes right to the heart. This couple came to a farm and they said, we gotta get the animals off here because we're gonna make a wilderness area. And the farm went to pot and they brought the animals on and started building soil with it. And so, so I, think, I think we need to just forget the vegans. But forget, don't, don't, don't waste your time on that. It's fringe, it's, it's a fad, it's urban disease, it's silly, okay? Okay. You focus your energy on building soil and using animals to save the planet. <laughs> it also could be an eating disorder, but um, Joel, you obviously have, uh, I'm Derek Taylor from Moldenica. I'm not a farmer, I'm an architect, but I'm looking from the outside. 
It would seem that you've got lots of the ideas sussed. How about, have you considered setting up a, a franchise so you could roll out in other places? The poly yeah, I've considered, it, I've considered a franchise for about 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> no, I don't want to set a franchise. I don't copyright any of this stuff. I just want it to be duplicated around the world and people will be successful. It's open source. Anyone can come 24-7, 365, from anywhere in the world to see anything, anytime, unannounced. That's our transparency open door policy. We just want you to do it. Yeah, you've got the last word, Phil. Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, Phil Stocker, National Sheep Association. You made a very strong and powerful case for uh, deregulation. Um, and we know that regulation is uh, res restrictive, and we also know that many regulations, bad regulations, leads to a whole range of completely unintended consequences as well. I think most people in this audience would, would agree with that, that approach, and yet it is ironic that as we're leaving the EU, a lot of us would be fighting to maintain or even strengthen our regulation, particularly in the area of environment and animal welfare. And yet yesterday we talked a lot about uh, considering outcomes more and more. How can we, how can we deregulate, get positive outcomes, mm. and make sure that we're achieving outcomes we want and, and not causing problems? You know, what are the tools that we sure. can use to do that? Listen, it's, what's a great question. All right, so, so my, look, you can either, you can either regulate or incentivize from the top what you want or you can create a very um, whatever uh, um, diversified um, playing field on the bottom and try to bring from the bottom up through just the, 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 disrupt, the disruptions of innovation okay uh, like like the Uberization of the of the taxi world, all right. Airbnb. I mean, these are huge. Dis Amazon.com. I mean, it's a, it's a massive disruptor. Okay. Uh, um, and but here's the thing: we now have brand new tools. We have brand new tools through social media, through drone videography, all to tell our story. It's a beautiful story of pastoral mosaics. We can we can paint pictures like our fathers and mothers could never have painted, all right? And so, so let me just touch you with this. The, 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 um, the industrialization of agriculture and, and the food system created industrial opaqueness. You know, guard gates, razor wire, right? Um, either physical or non-physical opaqueness. Nobody could see, you know, Michael Pollan said in Omnivore's Dilemma, if all the factory houses had glass walls, it would fundamentally change our food system. He was exactly right. The point is that the regulations, here's the thing I want you to understand. The, 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 the industrial scale regulations came in as a result of the industrial scale opaqueness in the food system, people felt disempowered and they wanted something bigger to control something big. Today, with the uberization, the atomization of the economy, we now are creating an obsolescence of industrial scale regulations because we have now reintroduced the village conversation. Now our village may be across even country borders, okay? But now, the reason they didn't need this back with the butcher baker candlestick maker was because everybody in the village knew who the shyster was. They knew who the good one was. They knew who the bad one was. The bad ones didn't get patronized and the good ones got. The market voted for what they wanted. Through industrialization, we made everything anti-human scale, so anti-human scale, people got scared and said, Ooh, we need something anti-human scale to protect us from these guys, from, from their opaqueness and their shysterism and their blah, 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 okay? All right. Now, we are moving into the atomization and the, the democratization of information and the ubiquitousness of being able to explain our stories, show our stories, and show our environmental benefits and the, and the nesting bird and the, and the, 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 the calving heifer on grass, and, all right? All right. We can now do that, and that is creating an obsolescence of the of the regulatory industrial structure, just like 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 the like the feedback loop on Uber drivers 
protects the Uberization from shysters because they, they register, don't patronize this driver. Guess what? That driver doesn't exist very quickly, okay? And so we now have that democratization of direct access into the marketplace that we haven't had for 60 years. And so that is a disruptor that is atomizing our ability and we desperately need now an atomization of access for us in the food sector to Uberize the local food system. Now, now may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. May the foxes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. <laughs> May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you so much, God bless you.